seven blessings to you all. This is the first episode of Archmaester Buzzkill's Personal Studies, part of the podcast series called Through the Moon Door. I am currently crouching in the attic of my house, because that is the only place where there is no echo. And because I'm a podcast rookie, I'm recording this on my phone, sitting in the damp dark, trying not to catch the audio from my dad's stereo that is blasting in the living room downstairs. Now, <laughs> in today's first episode of Archmaster Buskill's Personal Studies, which will be a series focusing on literary analysis of George R. R. Martin's wonderful work, A Song of Ice and Fire, that has sadly not gotten too much attention by literary researchers. Now, I'm obviously not a peer-reviewed expert. I'm just an English student uh, making my way through university. But I thought that I should put my research to some good use. And so, today I will talk to you about one of the most iconic elements of George R. R. Martin's work, the dragons. I will analyze them, trying to look at the the narrative function of the dragons. It is, of course, uh, I think it's in the acknowledgments of the fourth book, fifth book maybe, where George R. R. Martin thanks one of his friends for making him put the dragons in. And I find this very interesting. So he was on the fence about it. So what made him finally decide to put them in? What what function do they serve? I will look at that in the context of two other very famous dragons of fantasy literature and compare what, you know, their characterization, their role with that of A Song of Ice and Fire. But that is enough prelude. Let's get started. In a manuscript that would later serve as the basis for his famous lecture, The Monsters and the Critics, J.R.R. Tolkien had this to say about dragons. Whatever dim origin he has in prehistoric facts or fears, the dragon, as we have him in legend, is one of the more potent creations of men's imagination. And I must agree with Tolkien on this. There really seems to be something about these infamous beasts that draws both writers and readers towards them. Uh, throughout all of their century-spanning history, uh, dragons have managed to remain popular and relevant, making their way into myths of old, countless novels of varying genres and quality, and in more modern times, film and television. Now, whether or not its origins lie in prehistoric fears, as suggested by Tolkien. We may never know for certain. But what we do know is that almost every culture, be it Western or Eastern, insofar as those words even mean anything, almost every culture has produced some form of what we would recognize as a dragon. To keep things a bit short, because I suspect that this will already be far too long, I will focus my analysis on the Western literary tradition, starting my analysis of the narrative function of dragons in the context of A Song of Ice and Fire with the OG of Western dragons, the, the, the original Chad, <laughs> Beowulf's Bane. Beowulf's Bane, the nameless dragon from the poem called Beowulf, which is an old English poem written sometime between the 7th and the 11th century. No one really knows for sure. It may not be the oldest dragon tale, but it's certainly one of the most famous. It tells the story of a legendary Danish king called Beowulf, who fights three monsters. First, the monster called Grendel, a sort of humanoid ogre kind of thing. Then Grendel's mother. And in his third and final duel, a dragon. Now, any analysis of Beowulf, or even dragons in general, must take into account, must feature the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Nearly 
every academic paper that's ever been written about Beowulf cites Tolkien's writings about the Old English poem, particularly his lecture, The Monsters and the Critics. But it's not just his scholarly contribution that make Tolkien relevant for this paper. In his 1937 novel, The Hobbit, Tolkien introduced the world to Smaug, an iconic dragon that would become the prototype dragon of the 20th century. The Hobbit is a very traditional fantasy tale. Its story about a group of dwarves journeying to reclaim the treasures of their ancient kingdom draws heavily from both Norse and English mythology, including Beowulf. This is particularly apparent in the last third of the novel, when Bilbo Baggins and his dwarf companions reach the lonely mountain guarded by the dragon Smaug. Like Beowulf's Bane, Smaug is a hoarding dragon who, when a thief steals a cup from his treasure, goes on a rampage that is only ended when he is slain by a heroic figure. The obvious connections between the two tales makes it particularly interesting to compare them and look at which aspects of the Beowulf dragon Tolkien saw to fit, to keep, to adapt into his own work, and where he saw perhaps room for improvement. Since nearly every entry in the fantasy genre since 1937 has been largely inspired by Tolkien's The Hobbit, and later, of course, The Lord of the Rings, uh, it is hard to find any singular modern work that shares the same kind of connection that The Hobbit shares with Beowulf. It must be a work that both shaped the image of the dragon in popular culture, as well as a work that took inspiration from Smaug, the same way he did from Beowulf's Spain, or rather Tolkien did from Beowulf, building and perhaps improving on the groundwork laid by Tolkien. Now, arguably, or perhaps not even arguably, the most famous dragons of the 21st century are those popularized by the immensely successful television series Game of Thrones, which is based on the vastly superior source material George R. R. Martin's epic fantasy A Song of Ice and Fire. Part of the success of Martin's work is that he sets out to subvert classical fantasy elements, like those popularized by Tolkien and his imitators. Realism, in quotations, because we're talking about fantasy, is an important aspect of his highly complex narrative. The fantasy elements are rare, which makes it even more interesting to look at why he chose to still include dragons and what narrative function they serve in this morally grey, gritty and realistic setting. What do I mean by narrative function? Well, it's quite self-explanatory, really. It means what function do the dragons serve in the narrative? Dragons can serve many functions. They can be villains, protagonists, plot devices, symbols and allegories. But it is the distinction between functioning as characters, villains, protagonists, etc., and functioning as plot devices that is particularly important to this podcast. In The Monsters and the Critics, Tolkien's famous Beowulf lecture, Tolkien was the first to propose that the monsters in Beowulf Grendel, Grendel's mother, and the dragon, were essential, allied to the underlying ideas of the poem. He pulled them into the center of his literary analysis, saying that one could not understand the meaning of the work without understanding the function of the monsters. In that same lecture, Tolkien criticized the Beowulf dragon for not being and I quote, dragon enough. He said that the Beowulf dragon was draconitas rather than draco. Draconitas means dragon-like. It refers to a dragon that serves as a personification, for example, of greed or malice, or as an allegory, without ever developing a life of its own. In short, a plot device. Opposed to that, we have Draco, 
which Tolkien describes as a real worm with a bestial life and thought of its own, a definition that could also be applied to Draco Malfoy from Harry Potter, or maybe leaving out the thought of its own bit. In other words, a Draco is a real proper character. Now, Tolkien seems to have very fixed ideas on what narrative functions a dragon should fulfill, clearly preferring the, the characters over the allegories. So we will see what he would think of the dragons from George R. R. Martin's work. We already know what he thinks about the one from Beowulf and probably also about his own dragon. Unlike Smaug or Martin's dragons, Beowulf's bane does not appear in a novel, but is part of mythology. The mythological dragon is the father of all dragons and by far the best researched one. Now, Tolkien, as I've already pointed out, famously criticized Beowulf's bane for not being dragon enough, but he did concede that there are instances in which the dragon is a real worm with a beast alive and a thought of its own. So despite his criticisms, Tolkien still used Beowulf's bane as one of his major inspirations in creating Smaug, the other one being the dragon of Fafnir. Where are these instances of Draco that Tolkien saw in the Beowulf dragon? Well, to analyse Beowulf's bane, we must analyse the dragon's surroundings. The description of the dragon, as well as of its horde, hints at deeper symbolic and allegorical meanings. In Michael Swanton's translation of the poem, the dragon's horde is described as a lofty dwelling, a high stone barrow and a secret, splendid hall, surrounded by wilderness. There is a clear contrast to the, to the description of the dwelling of Grendel and his mother, Immeasurability and open-endedness are the key images associated with the dragon, whereas there is a focus on concrete detail and a concern for measure when describing Grendel and his mother. The poet, whoever they may be, seems to draw a clear line between the first two foes Beowulf faces and his third and final foe, the dragon. Grendel and his mother are kin of Cain, they are not only related to each other, but related to the human race as well, and thus wholly different to the dragon. Their dwelling is situated near the world of the human characters, while the dragon's den is far away in the desolation, not of Smaug, but of Beowulf's bane. The den is far away in the wilderness. The description of its surroundings make it seem otherworldly and non-human clearly setting it apart from Grendel and his mother. For this talk of immeasurability and limitlessness, it should be noted that we do eventually get a description of the dragon's shape. However, this is only after the beast is dead. The dragon is described as 50 feet long, a scaled serpent, venomous and fire-breathing. The only aspect of its appearance that deviates from the traditional dragon image is its lack of legs. What function does Beowulf's bane serve in the poem? There are essentially three ways of looking at the dragon from Beowulf. The realistic, the symbolic and the allegorical reading. In a realistic reading, the dragon could be read simply as an obstacle a foe to be slain by the heroic protagonist Beowulf that could have been replaced by any other monster or any enemy army without changing the meaning of the narrative. This is, however, not very satisfying, and there are multiple hints within the text that point towards some deeper meaning of the dragon, despite its role as an obstacle. Which brings us to the symbolic reading of the dragon. The fiery serpent with its snake-like body and venomous fangs lent itself to be read as a symbol for evil or death itself. The absence of its legs gives it a more snake-like appearance that evokes images of that ancient serpent, the devil, symbolizing all manner of sins, such as hate, envy, pride or greed. The fact that the dragon is guarding a gold word, an old English word, 
further reinforces the idea that it is a symbol for the sin of covetousness. There are others who object to such readings, claiming that the dragon's symbolic meaning is not clear-cut but ambiguous. What can certainly be said is that the dragon's hoarding of the treasure, despite it having no practical use for the gold, and its rage when being stolen from, make it a personification of greed. Tolkien saw it as a, sim as a symbol for the undiscriminating cruelty of fortune, seeing as though it causes Beowulf's death and lays waste to the land. The researcher Keller seems to share this belief, as he calls Beowulf's bane an amoral evil, uh, impersonal like an illness. Despite acknowledging the hints and a deeper meaning of the dragon, Tolkien rejected the hypothesis that the tale of Beowulf's slaying of the dragon could be read as an allegorical homily. Others agree, stating that the poem, while having allegorical tendencies, is not an allegory in any simple way. However, if we accept the idea of the dragon symbolizing the devil, the ancient serpent, the enemy till doomsday, then Beowulf's fight could be read as an allegory for man's unending contest with the powers of darkness. Beowulf's bane is certainly a mythological dragon, whose description hints at it being a symbol for a sort of eternal, amoral, unknowable evil, a foe wholly different from Grendel or his mother, the kind of enemy that is appropriate for a heroic king. It is as Tolkien says, the placing of the dragon at the end of the Beowulf tale is inevitable. The slaying of a dragon is the greatest deed. It is the only worthy opponent for Beowulf, and that is its narrative function. A personification of perhaps the greatest of evils, Beowulf's bane provides our hero with a final battle and a worthy hero's death. From that ancient serpent, Beowulf, we now move on to a real worm, Smaug. Taking a closer look at Smaug will be particularly interesting now that we have outlined Tolkien's own thoughts on what a good dragon ought to be like. The researcher Honegger, who wrote an excellent book about the history of dragons in literature, claims that, before Tolkien, most dragons served as plot devices, allegories for evil, meant to highlight the hero's capabilities instead of living up to their potential as protagonists, which seems to apply to Beowulf's Bane. However, most critical literature about The Hobbit treats Smaug as a plot device. It seems that we should expect Smaug to be pure Draco, a real worm, cunning and villainous, but bestial at the same time, the way Tolkien intended. A dragon who enriches the narrative by his presence and does not simply fulfill the role of obstacle. But on the other hand, why then do so many researchers treat him as a plot device the same way they do Beowulf's Bane? Following the structure of our analysis of Beowulf's Bane, we will begin with a closer look at Smaug's physical appearance, with a special focus on elements Tolkien adapted from Beowulf, and those he saw fit to change or modernize. The first thing we see of Smaug in The Hobbit is something described as the glow of Smaug, which might be radiating heat, fire, or some hint at the dragon being magical and otherworldly, the latter being an attribute also emphasized in the description of Beowulf's bane. Smaug is further described as a vast red golden dragon with a huge coiled tail akin to an immeasurable bat. The red and gold colouring hints at the dragon's fiery nature, but also has a certain regal connotation, highlighting the majesty of the great fire drake. The description of Smaug's tail is somewhat of a diversion from the look of Beowulf's bane, which is very serpent-like, almost like a winged snake. Whereas Smaug seems to have an actual body, he also has, in addition to his two wings, four legs, which makes him a classical dragon. The term immeasurable, on the other hand, is a descriptor associated with both dragons, Beowulf's Bane and Smaug. Tolkien made Smaug a little more conventional in his appearance, while still evoking that sense of otherworldly limitlessness associated with the Beowulf dragon. <laughs> 
The surface similarities between the dragons in Beowulf and the Hobbit have mostly been mentioned before, the main ones being that both dragons are hoarding dragons that slumber atop the, a pile of treasure they are guarding. Uh, Smaug awakes after Bilbo steals a cup from his dwelling, much like Beowulf Spain. It is, however, after the theft takes place that the key difference between the two dragons becomes apparent. Tolkien gives us insight into Smaug's mind, not just describing his anger over being stolen from, but letting the reader experience his thought process. He awakens from a nightmare in which a small warrior means to slay him with a sword. He is angry with himself over not having blocked the entrance Bilbo used to slip into the mountain. Where Beowulf Spain expresses a kind of animalistic wrath, Smaug seems justified in his anger. There is a sense of reason and legitimacy to his quest for vengeance. One gets the sense that he chooses to go after the thieves, whereas Beowulf Spain acts on instinct. This is a very key difference between the two dragons. Smaug is a free agent with a distinct personality, inner thoughts, and even fears. He is cunning and villainous, a trait that becomes particularly apparent when he is confronting Bilbo and cleverly deducts that he came from Lake Town. This is what Tolkien's Draco is all about. Smaug has thoughts of his own. He is not just a means to an end, but a character, the true villain of The Hobbit. How then is it possible that most criticism of The Hobbit has treated him as a plot device? Even with Smaug, who unsurprisingly fits Tolkien's Draco criteria better than any other dragon, there are hints at Draconitas, dragon likeness, that deserve mention. Upon entering Smaug's dwelling and seeing the vast treasure, Bilbo is filled with the desire of dwarves, as it says in the text, and so enamoured by the riches that he almost forgets the immense dragon atop of it. Greed is a main theme of The Hobbit. The dwarfs desire the wealth of their ancient kingdom, and later the battle of the five armies is fought over the treasures of Erebor. Smaug is the means through which the consequences of greed are experienced, as the researcher Petty put it. Smaug can be seen as a guarding dragon, fulfilling the dragon's oldest and most basic function as an obstacle. This would make him similar to Beowulf's bane. However, Smaug is not the final obstacle of the narrative. His death sets the stage for the Battle of Five Armies. Nor does he provide our heroes with a worthy death. It is not Bilbo who slays Smaug, but Bard, an old bowman from a line of kings, introduced to the narrative only moments before he brings down the dragon. If anything, Tolkien created him as a plot device to provide Smaug with a worthy end, not the other way around. Clearly he regards Smaug as not merely an obstacle, but a character who stays true to his mythological roots, both in his appearance and his evil nature, while at the same time having thoughts of his own, feelings and fears, and the ability to interact with other characters. Tolkien's Draco is a marriage of tradition and innovation that makes for a great villainous character. It is now time that we turned... To the Dragons by George R. R. Martin, Daenerys' children, fire made flesh. To start with, the amount of dragon content within A Song of Ice and Fire is far greater than what we have in Beowulf or The Hobbit, whereas Beowulf's Bane and Smaug appear towards the end of their respective stories, Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion make their appearance at the very end of A Game of Thrones, the first entry in the series, and stay with us all the way to the end of A Dance with Dragons, the, uh, so far, last book. While this provides far more material for literary analysis, far less scholarly work has been done regarding Martin's dragons, especially when compared to Beowulf and The Hobbit, despite the immense popularity of the books. This popularity is in part due to the way Martin subverts traditional fantasy elements. Does Martin, instead of marrying tradition and innovation the way Tolkien did, completely subvert the way dragons function in narratives? The depiction of dragons in fantasy is becoming increasingly naturalistic, and A Song of Ice and Fire is no exception to this trend. Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion are not traditional six-limbed creatures like Smaug, instead of falling into the category of wyvern, meaning they only have four limbs, a pair of legs and a pair of wings. It should be noted as an aside here that wyverns also appear in A Song of Ice and Fire, 
but they are merely creatures who also have two wings and two legs, but they cannot breathe fire. But in the traditional terminology, wyverns are dragons that only have four limbs compared to six-limbed classical dragons. It's just so there's no confusion there. So George R. R. Martin's dragons have a slightly more scientifically accurate look, seeing as though there are no animals in the real world that sport both four legs and two wings. Martin also makes it a point to compare them to other real animals when describing them. He mentions the movement of their heads to be similar to that of snakes, and at times he refers to them as serpents. In this, they are similar to Beowulf's Bane and Smaug, with the exception that their anatomy seems more plausible. Another important matter when talking about the physicality of dragons is the question of size. Both Beowulf's Bane and Smaug are enormous beasts, Tolkien doesn't give exact measurements the way the Beowulf poet does, but the context clues hint at a respectable size. Martyr's dragons, too, can grow very large, their wings drowning entire towns in shadow when they fly overhead. However, when we first get introduced to the dragons, they are mere hatchlings, no larger than cats. This marks an important difference to Smaug and Beowulf's Bane. It is important. It is hard to imagine either of them as small and defenceless hatchlings. They seem like great mythological beasts that came into the world massive and deadly as they are. Martin, on the other hand, chooses to have the dragons grow up before the reader's eyes. It is this kind of subversion of common dragon tropes that marks Martin's creations. When analysing the function of a dragon... It is important to look at when in the narrative it first appears. Beowulf's Bane starts its destructive rampage after Beowulf has ruled as king for 50 years, disturbing a long, prosperous and peaceful rule. Smaug presents himself in the moment that Bilbo is sent by the dwarves to prove his value to their mission, establishing himself as an obstacle to our hero. In A Song of Ice and Fire, however, the dragons appear as saviours, right at the lowest point of Daenerys Targaryen's arc in A Game of Thrones. After Miri Mazdur murders Khal Drogo, as well as her unborn child Rago, Daenerys sets up a funeral pyre for both, binding the witch to it before stepping into the flames herself. Against all odds, Daenerys emerges unscathed and in possession of three dragons, hatched from the fossilized eggs she carried into the fire. This miraculous event ensures her the loyalty of the remainder of her husband's Kalasar. The dragon's birth is described with a very positive language, when Martin writes that for the first time in hundreds of years the night came alive with the music of dragons. The reader rejoices. It is unlikely that the inhabitants of Middle-earth or mythical Scandinavia would celebrate the return of their respective types of dragons with similar enthusiasm. Martin makes us sympathise with the dragons by highlighting their close connection to the Nerus, the heroine of the story. Having become infertile due to the witch's sorcery, the Nerus regards her dragons as the only children she will ever have. They are named after her dead husband and her two dead brothers. The idea of the dragons being Daenerys's children makes sense not only to her, but to the reader as well. They are described as sucking milk from her breasts after they are born, they are dependent on her for survival while they are too young to hunt and protect themselves. Martin cleverly subverts the classical tale of a dragon guarding a beautiful princess, making it the dragons that are dependent on the princess's protection. These are not the only aspects of the classical dragon that Martin subverts. A common feature of dragons is that they are not part of the civilized world. It's the classic idea of here be dragons to mark uncharted territory on medieval maps. Something that is true for both Beowulf's Bane, who dwells in a funeral mound in the wilderness, and Smaug, who lives in the ruin of the once great dwarf kingdom of Erebor, surrounded by desolate and empty land. We may recall that the second movie in the Terrible Hobbit trilogy was called The Desolation of Smaug. While it is true that most of Daenerys' story takes place on the continent of Essos, 
in places that would be on the edge of most maps used by the other main characters, her journey brings her to great and ancient cities who all desire to possess dragons of their own. Furthermore, the dragons are associated with the great but fallen city of Valyria, which marked the high point of civilization in the history of the known world, not despite, but because of the dragons that dwelt there, their fire being used to build roads and buildings of fused rock and unrivaled swords of Valyrian steel. Daenerys herself is descendant from the great dragon lords that ruled this ancient realm. The members of her family, the Targaryens, call themselves the blood of the dragon and take great pride in their ancestors' mastery of the beasts. The dying of the dragons is thus considered a tragic event. The slayers of the last dragons were not great heroes, but angry mobs of peasants during the Dance of Dragons, uh, or an order of old men, the maesters of the citadel, who conspired to poison the last crippled hatchlings, if you believe that theory, as I do. Their return, the return of the dragon, that is, has an important impact on the setting as it marks the return of magic to the world. Martin manages to make the reader marvel at his dragons almost as much as the characters in the story do. We feel sympathy for them. While we cheer for Beowulf to slay his dragon and for Bard to shoot down his, we do not want to see Daenerys' children slain. When Smaug descends on Lake Town, we fear for its inhabitants, yet we long to see Daenerys ride her dragon into battle and set her enemies' castles ablaze. While Tolkien manages to make readers empathize with Smaug by conveying his thoughts and feelings to them, Martin manages to make them feel sympathy while still maintaining the dragon's status as amoral animals. When hunting, they do not distinguish between human and non-human prey, as is uh, emphasized in Drasnak's pit when Drogon feasts on both the boar and the person who fought it. They even kill a child at one point. They are not characters in the way Smaug is a character, but they still regain a level of agency. They do not simply exist for Daenerys to have access to biological superweapons. There are genuine emotional bonds between her and her children. Drogon even saves her Daenerys' life when she is threatened by the Undying Ones in Calf, who mean to suck her life force from her. Martin's writing seems to be influenced by the changing perspective on animal rights in the 20th century, giving us dragons that do not blur the lines between human and animal the way Smaug does, or seem altogether otherworldly, like Beowulf Spain, yet evoke sympathy on the reader's part, possess a certain level of agency, and are described as creatures worthy of protection and respect. We have reached the conclusion of this first episode. The goal of this podcast was to examine three literary works in order to make out trends and developments in the depiction and function of dragons in narratives. Beowulf, being one of the oldest and most famous accounts of a dragon slayer, was chosen to reflect on the mythological dragon concept, while The Hobbit was meant to showcase a dragon heavily influenced by Beowulf Spain, but adapted and refined for more modern times. The last work, A Song of Ice and Fire, is a work that heavily subverts many of the tropes found in fantasy and enjoys immense popularity. It was chosen to present a take on dragons that is very modern and different from the first two sources. I showed that the two main narrative functions of dragons are those of Draconitas and Draco, terms coined by Beowulf scholar and Hobbit author J.R. Tolkien, describing the difference between dragons introduced to the narrative as plot devices, mostly for the purpose of allegory, and dragons that serve as cunning, villainous characters. The dragon in Beowulf largely fits into the first of these two categories, Draconitas, Despite some hints at being a genuine Draco, for example its villainous nature, the dragon's main purpose is providing Beowulf with a worthy last battle and a hero's death, while at the same time serving as a symbol of a moral, unknowable evil. Smaug, on the other hand, fits neatly into the Draco category, which is hardly surprising, seeing as though the criteria was invented by his creator. Smaug is a character. His inner thoughts and feelings get conveyed to the reader. His acts, therefore, don't seem like the blind rage of an animal, but somewhat rationally justified. At the same time, Tolkien manages to integrate aspects of the mythological Beowulf dragon, such as his natural lust for gold and evil nature, 
skillfully combining them with his concept of Draco. George R. R. Martin largely abandons traditional aspects of the classical dragon, aside from the general look and the ability to breathe fire. His dragons are neither great mythological beasts nor villainous, but instead simply animals, in essence no different to a dog. They are amoral, their nature neither evil nor benevolent, yet the characters in the story still form deep emotional connections to them, and their agency is maintained without humanizing them in any way. They are neither plot device nor good dragons, as Tolkien would define it, but they are simply majestic animals that both their mother and the readers would want to protect from dragon slayers at all costs. And that wraps up our first episode of Archmaster Buzzkill's Personal Studies, a series that desperately needs a new, snappier name. Maybe I should name it The Citadel's Attic, because I'm stuck up here in my own attic with a, a big old spider sitting in the corner that I have named Beleriom the Dread. Ha ha ha. Fitting, kind of, for this episode. Thank you all very much for listening to this like and uh, subscribe and do whatever it is you do. I have no idea. I've never made a podcast. Please, please let me know in the comments uh, what I could improve and what you would like to see next, because quite frankly, I have no idea what the next episode is going to be about. But until then, seven blessings. May the Lord be with you. May the old gods watch over you. Goodbye.